Susie Long has agreed to speak to us this evening about how it is living with blindness. And she welcomes any and all questions. And she's going to share her journey. I've known Susie for maybe 10 years. At least 10 years. Yeah, that's 10 years. about right. And so I've watched her during her different phases of becoming um, blind. And she's a wonderful inspiration for us all. And we love you. Oh. <laughs> so, I'm turning it over to you, Susie. I think Cindy is one of the few people, well, maybe not. Reynolds, I think, are here, and, and you probably uh, watched the progression as well. But um, I felt as my eyesight really took a turn for the worse in, in, in November of 2003, and all of a sudden everything went haywire. And the day after Thanksgiving, I uh, was in my doctor's office, and he said, I, I've never seen anything like this. You know, it's not just one thing. I had full-blown retinopathy, um, um, glaucoma that was off the charts, and um, Graves' ophthalmic disease that was also had inflamed my um, um, yeah, and the, well, the optic nerve, which was very, very close. It was, and the, the, the thing with the optic nerve is, is once it's damaged, it cannot be repaired. Well, if you, um, once you go that far, it's a point of no return. So my ophthalmologist, I had a team of them, and they were all specializing their own little niche and they were amazing. I felt like Humpty Dumpty. They would put me back together again and then something else would go wrong and they put me back together again. So even as being a diabetic for now 55 years, um, the diabetes was really not the cause of any of the issues that I have, but it certainly didn't help any of the issues that I had as well. So the doctors, um, would, you know, as a diabetic, I've been hearing this since I was 17 and a half, you know, you watch for cardiac issues, you watch for kidney issues, you watch for liver issues, you watch for eye issues. But uh, it never occurred to me that something would happen to my eyes because I'd go in faithfully for my exams every year and the doctors would say, there's no sign of diabetes, it's amazing. No, how long have you been diabetic? No signs. And I heard this year after year after year. And so that's why it really took me aback that all of a sudden I didn't have heart issues, I didn't have kidney problems, I didn't have liver failure, but all of a sudden my eyesight was the issue. And, but again, a great team of doctors, they put me back together again, and Humpty Boon Humpty gets back up on the wall and everything is good. So, it wasn't until um, 2010, early 2010, um, it became so problematic. I had somebody helping me at work. They'd given me a huge CRT um, monitor. So it was, everything had been geared toward me. I was using a clip-on magnifier over my glasses to magnify everything. And it still got to the point that I just was not able to function. And of course, the more stressed you get, it was, became magnified. Everything was um, more problematic. So in 2010, um, our doctors had decided to um, outsource their billing, and I was working in a billing office and had been doing it for 24 years. I loved it, and I thought I would do this as, as long as I possibly could, and we finally got to the point where I no longer could do it. And, um, so at the, that, that point in time, I decided the best option for me was to take a retirement, and um, that's what I did. And at that point, we had started our big classes here, and um, it, was, it, it was amazing. Um, I, you know, for, for, for my entire life, I you know, was baptized as an infant, and um, I knew that God was in our corner. He, he's, uh, he's, his 
in all of our corners and you say the lord's prayer and every day you, when you say it you say thy will be done and i figured he's not going to give me something that i can't handle with him i know i can handle it and so that's the way i kind of approached it i never really went through a period where i was angry frustrated yes but not not angry um you don't want to, you know, use positive energy and and let it drain. So don't focus on the negative. You just focus on the positive. What what can you do? And Christy had suggested that I, you know, investigate getting an eye a, a, a guide dog, as my vision was getting more and more problematic. I um, I voluntarily gave up my driver's license in, in 2010 and that was probably a good thing um, I you know when you do that and you're, you're not you know I was only 63 years old I, I felt like oh man I, I was expecting to take grandkids and go do stuff and you know just grandkids and me and and all of that and all that that immediately went away and um but now katie has her driver's license and so the things that that we were planning to do uh, that i was going to be the driver now katie has, has promised me that she will be our driver and we will go do girl things and um and then brady will of course have to tag along but it's it's a different it's a it's different than you know you have visions of what you're going to do in your life and and the different phases and when you retire what you're going to do and um one of those projects was going through boxes and boxes and boxes of pictures that are now in christie's closets because i was going to you know finally do this put put them in an album you know organize them go back and relive everything that never happened so when um, Bill and I, uh, I had actually started the guide dog training, and um, those of you that knew me, I walked with a cane at all, you know, at, at that point in time, and that was amazing, because at least I wasn't tripping on stuff. I'd been known to do that a few times, and so, um, but the preparation for a guide dog, you have to, um, you have to know your territory, bottom line. You gotta know where you're going and how you're gonna get there and what obstacles might be in the way and just be aware. And with a cane, you're able to do that. But what a cane does not do was is tell you if a branch is hanging down, it's gonna wipe you out. Um, I've been there, done that. Um, it doesn't tell you that there's a trailer hitch hanging out over the the, dry, the driveway um, so that you're going to whack yourself on that. I've also done that. And canes are, are, are amazing, but a guide is um, trained to let you know when those kinds of obstacles are in the way. And so I also, um, what I have around my neck is my, my phone which has navigational aids in it. And it also, because now as a diabetic, I'm on the Dexcom 24 hour monitor and I have to keep the Dexcom device and my phone close together. So I just wear them around my neck because if I put them down, I'll never remember where they are and I'll never find them, even if I remember. So that's, um, it's annoying. Yes, when we're in church and it starts alarming because my sugars are too low or, you know, it is, it's annoyance, but it's the reality of my life. So you just deal with it. Um, having Joan has been amazing. I've had her now for four and a half years and she is seven. And I just talked to guide dogs on, on Monday and had my annual phone interview. They used to come out and um, the first few years I had her and make sure that everything was going well. And now we're, we're on a phone basis, not in now also because of COVID, they're doing so much more remotely. But um, 
and when when I talked to him the other day, I said, you know, I I listened to the the guide dog um, uh, webinars and phone um, seminars that they do, and and I hear some of the other people that have guides. Um, Joan is my guide. I'm her handler, uh, and they are they are amazing. The things that that they do, and I, and I am, I'm not wired that way. I, maybe they're a lot younger than I, but um, I've always said that I'm not as old as I think I am because you can't t t train an old dog to do new tricks and I'm retraining myself. Um, I never had a smartphone. I never thought I would have a need for a smartphone, but when I could no longer see a phone, uh, the smartphone's the only way to go and it provides me, um, uh, the, the navigational um, apps are, are amazing, and um, er, all the things that I use, I have very limited knowledge of it. I use exactly what I need to know, and I don't want to be confused with anything more. And, and it's, I'm so easily confused, oh, yeah. <laughs> Just give me, what I, give me the basics and I'll, and I'll figure it out. But um, anyhow, so Joan, became my, my partner. And um, she technically, every handler has the relationship with the dog and they have rules that you're supposed to follow. And I have to freely admit that I've been very lax about the uh, rules. Initially, um, I, was, I would not let people touch her or anything. And then I saw how much happier she is when she gets attention and people are loving on her and she's loving it and she loves the kids. And so I would allow people to do that. Now with COVID, I can't. Now I have to um, really respect that people are not touching her. Um, and that's hard for her too, because she'll see people that she is used to, using, used to get attention from and all of a sudden she can't because that's, you know, we're, we're being very, very careful. But, um, but she still gives me the ability to go out and go for a walk. And we'll go for at least, usually a mile and a half a day. And it's very rare that we don't do a walk. If it's, you know, if our schedules just don't permit, or if I won't walk outside when it's, um, when it's icy anymore. I, it just, it's not worth the risk of falling and harming myself. And so I don't in those, and if, if the weather's horrible, I won't go. Um, both hot and cold this summer, we've, you know, the smoke has been horrible. So it, when it was in the hazardous range, we wouldn't go for both, for both of our healths. But um, other than that, we usually do our walks. And that's where I meet people and I feel like, I, COVID has affected so many people in so many ways, but my world had been kind of um, closing for so many years. I don't think it's really affected me as much as other people uh, because I've learned just, I have a world that's expanded because, of, because I do have Joan and I, do, I can use a cane. So it does allow me to do a lot, but it's um, not the same as being restricted in so many other ways. Uh, the things that I really miss that I can't, you know, that I, um, I, I know what Christy looks like, although I will have to admit that there were Sundays in church where I would say I could hear Christy's voice, but I couldn't see her. And somebody say she's right there and she was right there and I couldn't recognize her. So that during, just before I got to the point where I really couldn't see anything. I really couldn't see faces. I could recognize voices, and then I'd figure, okay, this face is in front of me. Cindy was the first one that said to me, Susie, I've lost 35 pounds. I look great. And I thought... I remember that. Yeah. I always saw that. I look great. Yeah. Do you yeah. remember me skinny? I did. <laughs> so I, you know, I have no idea what people look like except for the memory that I have. So um, why do I wear glasses? I can't, they don't help me see. 
I mean, I'm be well beyond that. Very nice. And but I, that's my vision of myself. That's how I remember myself. Why do I stand in front of a mirror? You know, I it doesn't help me in the least. But the, but that's also you know where my comb and brush are. So <laughs> so like it just happens to be. But um, they do, actually the the glasses do help me with wind. Uh, my eyes get dry easily, and so um, it does kind of deflect some of that. I, when my eyes were, there was a period of time when my eyes were super photosensitive. I couldn't handle any sort of light, and I had the big over glasses that um, they did a great job of that, but they're really more than I need, so I don't use those anymore. I can't, the light, I see light, um, I can, I, I know there's light up here, I can't see anything else, everything else is dark. So I have that perception and that's a huge gift. Um, I, uh, navigationally, as, as anything else, um, when I'm walking, if it's after dark, I don't generally go after dark, but if I do the street lights, I can see, okay, there's a, there's a light over here, so I know there has to be an intersection coming in, coming up, if my phone weren't talking to me, which we went through a little bit of that. We had about three weeks where we didn't have, our phones weren't working at all. So I was back to the basics, you know, counting steps and, and um, hoping that Joan knew where we were and get, hoping that nobody interrupted me so I knew which block I was on because they're all so similar. But, you know, you just, you learn to adapt. It's different. It's not, it's not something to be, oh, you know, how sad. It's too bad. I mean, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have said, um, I'll sign up for Be Blind. It, that's okay. But there are so many other issues that people have, especially as we age, that you can't, you know, there are things that are far worse than having to learn how to do something new. And besides which, that keeps me younger, right? So um, I really don't, unless other people can think of questions, I think my journey has been one that um, I really think that if anybody were faced with the same challenges, they probably would approach it pretty much the same way. Either that or you just decide to give up and I'm, I'm not willing to do that. So um, you deal with what you have and you're thankful for the gifts that you do have. And I can still hear, so that's great. It's huge. Um, the, the tools that I use when I'm walking, I, I, they say that your, your senses um, are more acute when you lose one sense, that your other senses become more acute. And I'm not sure that that's really true, but I will say that you do pay attention to the other senses that you have. Um, I use, I, my, my mobility instructor, when, he, when I was training, he said, Susie, you have to get closed-toed sandals. And I thought, what's the point? It's hot, it's summer, you know? And he said, if you, if you damage your feet, he said, there, there's a sense right there. And boy, did he hit the nail on the head. If, um, I, I, the only time I wear open-toed shoes is coming to church where I'm familiar with the territory. It's very rare that I'll wear open-toed toed shoes. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have seen the sandals that I wear and they're closed. It doesn't do any good to have a pedicure because nobody sees my toes anyway because they're <laughs> hidden by the shoes. But, but they keep my toes safe. Even in the house, I don't go barefoot ever. I always have slippers on of some sort, some sort of shoe. Um, and that's, I, I get so much information from my feet, even walking and knowing the, in, you know, the nuances of pavement and um, at, at what corners, you know, there's more of a trip hazard or more of an uplift or um, so much uh, of the information I get really is from my feet. Um, and of course my ears. And if I blow it, Joan is there and she has saved my bacon numerous times. 
because it, I can't hear because it's a windy day and I can't hear cars and I'll tell her to go ahead and she won't go. And I'll tell her, give her the command, you know, Joan, forward, you know, and she doesn't want to move. And then I'll give her the other, and I'm not going to say it right now because then she'll probably get up, but um, the, the, the term we use is um, at H-O-P, U-P. And it's the, the way in which you say it, we can use it, um, you know, give them, you know, okay, come on, let's do it. And then there's the, you know, let's go faster. So we'll go say it a little bit firmer. And then when she's distracted, then you use the, uh, you, you never yell. I never yell at her. I never, um, uh, I just don't. I mean, and, and that's the way we're, we're trained not to, to, to give them positive reinforcement, which is her food pouch, and I wear it ever, all the time. So when she's good and she's not asking for it, she will be rewarded. If she's not, then she won't. And if she's asking for it, I won't offer it. Somebody, and I don't know who it was, on Sunday came up to me, and I guess she was looking really cute, and he took my hand and he pointed, he put his, the hand, my hand on her head. And it's like, she's being really cute. And it's like, she doesn't get rewarded for being cute. She has, she has nothing to do with that, or, you know. She had great parents, so that's all I can say. But, you know, her, and I just found this out this week. Um, uh, one of at guide dogs, one of the the fellows that answers phones and it gives all so much support. Anyhow, and I knew that he had a puppy out of Joan's litter, but I didn't know. I hadn't talked to him since I knew that. So um, he happened to get the call that, and when I called, and he said, "Did you say your dog's name is Joan?" And I said, "Yes." And he said, "Oh, my dog dog's Jamari," and he said. And I said, they're in the same litter, right? And I, I said, um, you, the parents are Tenley and Kurt. And he said, yes. And so then I said, you probably know more than I do. Which dog is it? Because I knew she was half yellow lab and half golden retriever. But I never knew which parent was which. Now, in the scheme of things, that really doesn't make any difference. But I, I was curious. And he said, oh, Tenley actually is a, a mix also. So she's half yellow lab, half golden retriever. So actually, Joni isn't really half and half. She's three quarters and one quarter. But she feels more like the three quarter. So, and, and when I feel, that, that she feels to me more like a lab. But I understand that her, her coloring, she has that reddish tone, which would be the golden retriever quality. Super mellow. So, well, you've seen her. She's a, just a super mellow dog. She's probably at the bottom rung of a dog that they would accept for working because she is so mellow. Um, and, and sometimes that's actually more problematic. The dogs that have more energy are probably easier to walk with and to train than somebody like Joan that's like, whatever. <laughs> but but she, is, she is super mellow, but she is a super worker. And this dog will point out every nuance in the, um, she is trained to, to point out changes in pavement. And she does. She will pick it up, and even and because it, we're in Nevada, they change all the time, and she'll point one out. It's like, yep, I would have tripped on that if she hadn't pointed it out. She points it out when we um, have DG that washes down from the the planters along the sides of the um, you know people's homes and so forth. Um, and so now we're going to be walking on something that's gritty, which also gets slippery. And she will point that out. And she points out um, if there are rocks in the way, if, if I'm walking, she'll slow me down so that I, I probe with my foot and figure out what it is that she's stopping for. And then, okay, we're good. We can get around this, we can do it. 
Um, she's amazing that way. And as I said, the overheads when branches come down. When we're walking um, alongside the car in a parking lot, and uh, so I'm going to the front of the, the car to, to the, if there's a curb or a, a, um, a walkway or any way, um, she'll always slow me down if there's a um, mirror. The trucks are notorious for having mirrors that stick out. She'll, she'll stop me every time, say, Mom, and I'll reach up. Sure enough, there's a, a mirror there that would probably would have wiped me out. So she, and not all dogs are um, as attuned to that as she is. Where she is gifted in that area, she's probably not so gifted in other areas. But she's, she's an amazing guide for me, and that's what guide dogs does. They, they try to match the dogs with their new handler, and they really, um, I, I'm just blessed to have her. And uh, the dog's working life, usually, it will go to, they've been working around nine years is the magic number. When she's nine, they'll start coming out and doing annual visits and, and check and make sure she's making good calls for me. And if she doesn't, it, that, at that point, if they decide, determine that it's, she's not capable of, of being you know, right on top of her game, then they actually take her, her harness and um, she is guide dog's dog. Um, I'm, just, I'm just kind of her custodian right now. But they will actually take her harness, and when they do that, she no longer will be able to be a guide. That doesn't mean that I can't keep her. I still could keep her, but she wouldn't be coming to church on Sundays, and she wouldn't be going to restaurants with us, and I, she, there'd be no way that she could guide me. But at that point, Bill would have to be my guide, or... Katie or Brady or, you know, somebody else would have to go with us, but she would not be able to guide me, even though she's had that, that background. And from what I understand, there's, there are guides that some people decide that they want to keep their retired guide, and then they'll get another guide. And sometimes the, the, the previous guide will really feel like, well, you used to do that with me, and now you're not, and kind of feel sad. Um, I would have the option to, to if I didn't keep her, to, to um, let guide dogs take her, and the first right of refusal would go back to the puppy raiser that raised her, and um, if they wanted to keep her. If not, they'd, they'd rehome her somehow. I could also ask that a family member um, Christy or, or Brett, our son, um, could have custody of her. Uh, the, I think that might cause a war. I think I'll just keep her. So, <laughs> anyway. Well, you don't have to worry for a couple of years. Yeah, no, I don't have if I, if you used to worry about that. But um, she's, you know, as I said, as I became, as I started losing my vision, your world just closes. Just closes the things that you used to do, you don't, you're not able to do anymore, or you're not able to do by yourself anymore. So your wheel, world just kind of shrinks. And you get to the point where if you don't have um, the ability to get some assistance and get some training and figure out there's other ways that you can do this and you can still explore, you can still get out and you can still enjoy your life. And um, at that point, as I said, I had, I had chosen to retire at that point in my life because I was at that, just about that age anyway. Um, but there are many, many blind people that uh, um, they've never known sight. How blessed am I, you know? I had 60, 63 years of full sight. And uh, so I know color, I know, I know flowers, I know the beautiful changing leaves. I know, you know, my handsome husband. I know my, my kids. What I don't know is what my grandkids look like. Katie, I have a little bit more of uh, uh, an idea because she was 11 by the time I lost total vision. So I kind of have an idea of what Katie looks like, but Brady, I don't have a clue. 
you know, here was this little kid. He was just this cute little guy. He still had all of his baby teeth, you know. I, you know, I can't believe it. And he just, last night, he stood next to me and he said, Grammy, and he loves teasing me. Grammy, I'm, I'm taller than you. And I said, well, most of the world's taller than me. So, <laughs> big deal. But, you know, it's a, it's a big game. And he is. He's playing, it's like, ah, but you have baby teeth. I, I, this is... <laughs> How, do you and, and how, do you, how can you be so full grown and still have baby teeth? I don't know. I, I don't know. But, um, you know, it's just a different way of, um, it's a, for those of you that have smartphones, which is probably everybody, it's a workaround. That's exactly what it is. You used to do it this way. It doesn't work like that anymore. We have a new update, so now we're going to find a different way to do what we did before. And sometimes um, <laughs> updates on phones are enough to drive me. Um, I, I don't drink, uh, but I, I think about it. Often I think, maybe, um, because there's, it's so frustrating to me, and it'll, it'll start popping up phrases that it's like, is that on a screen and I'm tapping and I'm not finding anything and I'm, you know, swiping, there's nothing there. And what's it doing? And then I'll have Bill look at it and he says, Susie, there's nothing there. And it's like, but it's telling me that there's something there, but there's nothing there. So like, it's, and it, for both of us, it's enough to really drive you nuts. And because I use the voiceover feature on my phone. So, um, and Bill does not. So um, the gestures are different. The, everything is different, but um, bottom line is it's like, well, I don't know what it's doing. Well, that's, that's code for I'm frustrated too, so just leave me alone. So, okay. <laughs> but um, anyhow, I don't know. It's like I started. Yes, that's my question. Why are you so accessorized in every uh, season you're with it? Okay. question is, why is Susie always matching and she goes with the seasons, her hair is perfect, she's accessorized, what did you do? Well, hairstyle is the same hairstyle I've had for eons, so that's just, it's just habit. Um, for, um, you know, clothes, um, I happen to have a daughter that picks out great tops for me, so... And a granddaughter that actually has taken me shopping and, and helped Grampy um, pick out which is really the best pair of pants. Grampy, you have to try on the tops and the bottoms because until you try it on, you don't really know the best one. So, okay, so that's painful for Bill, but Katie, it's great for Katie, and it's great for me. But when I when I organize our my closet because I had a plethora of clothes. Um, for, you know, because we have four seasons. Well, sometimes we have four seasons. So anyway, so I, I have one side of my closet has my spring and summer clothes in it, and the other side has my fall and winter clothes. And then, of course, you have your basic black, which is going to go wherever. It's going to go whatever. But you just remember, for me, everything is by color kind of grouped together and then I always put the, the clothes that I've had first will be in, in the at the front or the back whichever way I'm going um, and then as I add new clothes I add it to the opposite whoops opposite end um, so that um, it chronologically in my own mind I know well I bought this outfit first so this has to be with it and I group everything together as a, as a group and then if I decide that I want to wear that top with something else I know where I'm gonna find it Bill is not Bill does all of the laundry and um, I don't spot very well I I, I never get spots because if I don't see them they don't exist so <laughs> anyway so Bill, 
Yeah. I have to. <laughs> so just on Sunday, I said I was having him help me because taking fur off of clothes is really hard for me because I can't feel it at all. And so, um, so I'll have Bill do it. And so on Sunday, he's sitting there watching the game and trying to take the, you know, in my dark brown pants and taking the fur off. And finally, he looked and he said, Susie, these, these have dirt all over them. And I'm thinking, well, I wouldn't have known. So <laughs> you obviously told me they were good. And I, I don't know how I got that dirty. We're not even eating snacks at church anymore. So <laughs> I can't blame it on that. But I, in my own brain, my filing system is just when I purchased an outfit and what it, you know, um, and the, and the color, the, say, range of color. And, um, but I never remove a hanger. I always leave the hanger in the closet and take the clothes off of the hanger. So if you really, really want to just put me over the edge, do two loads of laundry together and give me too many clothes to put away. And by the time I'm through, I'm literally, seriously, at the point of tears. It just is more than my feeble brain can put all together. So one little laundry at a time. I have an idea of what I've got. I know where to find the hanger. That's good. If you start piling, and I do the same thing. Um, it's my job to wash dishes. Bill does the cooking. So I, I do all the, the, the dishes, but don't. Don't, I can't let let them pile up. I just can't. I have to deal with them as they as they accrue, and put them away. And then otherwise, I get so overwhelmed. It's so that's the thing I think that's really frustrating. I think all of us will feel overwhelmed um, with, with with circumstances or and for whatever reason, you you feel that way. But. For me, my threshold is so much lower now than it used to be. It takes very little to really overwhelm me. So just deal with it as it comes. And the bottom line is probably keeps the kitchen cleaner. I don't know. I don't have, I, I don't have a big kitchen to begin with, so we don't, you know, don't have room to pile up a bunch of dishes. But that's um, really and um, colors of clothes so you have navy blue and you have and there was a time that I wore a lot of navy blue and a lot of black and so and that was before I had Joan so um, I devised a, a um, my biggest aids are rubber bands safety pins and masking tape so I can put rubber bands around uh, medications so that I know which one, if, if I'm taking um, something that I don't normally take, if I have a rubber band around it, this is the one I'm taking right now. Um, uh, safety pins, though, are amazing. And I can, I can pile them up. So um, I take uh, four different eye drops. And so um, I'll put, if I'm only taking one, one well, that's how it started out. If I was only taking it once a day, I'd put one safety pin on it had a rubber band around it first, then a safety pin. And then um, then if I took a drop twice a day, which is most of them, so then I had two safety pins on that one. And then I can remember, you know, what, and then I know what it is, obviously, because I've been doing it for so long. But um, safety pins also are great on a label of, a cl of clothing, because then I can tell if that's the dark one, then it has a safety pin on the label. If it's the lighter, tone, then it doesn't have a safety pin on it. So that's how I keep my clothes kind of straight. And, and sometimes I do have to ask Bill to say, you know, which one is it? We had, this is funny, about um, about a year ago, year, no, yeah, about a year ago, um, I had dark brown pants and I had gray pants. And the jacket that I wore in church on Sunday is, is multicolors, but I wear it with both brown and gray, but generally with brown. And so I went to the closet to find it, and they weren't where I expected to find them. And so finally I said, honey, what, where are my brown pants? Now, I have to set this up. Men and women, this is true, men and women do not perceive color the same. 
So it's not, it's not you know, my husband. No, it's men and women do not perceive col color the same. So I said, to, you know, Bill, I, I can't find my brown pants. And he said, well, Susie, they're not in the dirty clothes. The laundry's all done. Everything's hung up. And I don't see them in the closet. And I said, well, I don't know what to tell you. I said, these feel more like my gray pants. And he said, no, they're brown. So this went back and forth. And I, and I thought, well, this jacket goes with both. So I guess I'm not going to sweat it. But good girl. Um, anyway, so about, about a week later, he's doing the laundry. And he, he said, Susie, I figured out the, the mystery of the brown pants. I said, well, what do, you, what do you mean? And he said, they were in the dirty clothes, but they were down at the very, very bottom where I didn't see them. They had other stuff in the way, and he said, I didn't see them. The mystery of the brown pants, and I, can you see the difference between the dark brown and the gray? And it's like, well, I guess, I guess when they're side by side, you can. And it's like, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Because so many of my pants are the same manufacturer you can't uh, you can't tell but you know some of them are different but you just pay attention to the waistbands on stuff and which ones have a phony waistband and which ones you know have just elastic or whatever and then you just have to remember so it's just one of those things that um, another old dog new trick thing you just gotta you gotta gotta figure it out but you know, what, I, I use this analogy when I got, I'm kind of jumping all over the place, but when I got Joan and I had trained with a cane, it, and you have to, with guide dogs, you have to have at least four to six months training in a, wherever you're, you're living in that area uh, before they'll even talk to you about, you know, forwarding your application to the proper departments. But anyway, so I'd walked our neighborhood multiple times and used the cane. And um, I, when I got back, I was kind of the remedial kid in the guide dogs class. The class only had six people in it, two women and four guys. And the, um, there were only another fellow and I were the only ones that had never had a guide before. So it was super intense. Um, just super stressful, but so much information. I mean, I l learned so much in that two weeks, but there was not much left of me. I mean, just there's so much to try to remember. So, but I was having some difficulty, and so they suggested that maybe they'd have a fellow come up and help me out in my neighborhood with my needs and tailor make, you know, what. You know, you can do things down there. It's it's a different way of life than it is up here. So, any, huh? Yeah, after yeah, after I brought her home. So anyway, we we're so we were walking, and um, I'd only been home for a couple of days, so we hadn't we hadn't I had, we had a clubhouse. I hadn't actually gone up there with her since we'd gotten home. But I did um, when we, um, when the fellows and guide dogs and my mobility instructor were both working with me, and we were walking up toward the clubhouse, and all of a sudden Joan just took off, and I said, "Oh my gosh, I feel like Peter Pan." I mean, it's like all of a sudden I could fly. <laughs> it's like you know, I didn't have to find an edge. I didn't. I didn't have to reach up for the railing. I didn't have to try to remember. You know, all of a sudden, she was she was just flying. She was going in, and she was going to find that door. And I thought, oh, this is amazing. I mean, this is truly, um, I think that was the moment that it, it just really hit me what a gift she was. And um, is it always that way? No. We got sideways just, just a few days ago. It doesn't, um, it, and, I never, and I never really know why, because... <laughs> I can't see it, 
So I don't know exactly what we did. It felt like, and that's, you know, Bill will describe things to me as what he sees, and this is what it looks like. But for me, I do everything by what it feels like. You know, I take X number of, I still count steps. So I take X number of steps and then there's gonna be a change. So I reach out to the right or the left or whatever, depending on where I am. This is all stuff you just learn along the way. It's just part of the journey. But uh, anyway, that's uh, my analogy is of, of having a guide. And at the time that, you know, she's taken out of service and I don't have her, I honestly don't think I have it in me to go back and get another one. Um, it takes time to train them as well. They are trained, they know the commands, the basic commands, but they do not know your neighborhood. They do not know where you're gonna go. And when I walk her, I, I very rarely use the same route. I'll shake it up, one, just even if it's just a little bit, I'll shake it up all the time to keep her sharp so that she's not just assuming that we're going here and we're not. And um, so different times of day, different light, different, um, just different everything. So um, anyway, it's, it has been amazing and I'm thrilled to have her, but come the time that she's not able to help me anymore, then we'll go back to using the cane and um, do the same things, maybe not as far, who knows? Who knows, that's in the future. Don't know. Yeah. Don't know what God's plans are for me. Can I interject for a couple of minutes here? Of course. Well, yep. I'll, I'll go to the mic. And for anyone who has a question, please go to the mic without touching it. This is a chronological presentation from Keith. <laughs> it's all started. tests they ran, blood tests and whatever, and MRI and a CAT scan and et cetera, et cetera. And that was just a, a four-day holiday, right? So trying to get this stuff done is not really easy. By Monday, we're back in the office and the retinologist is involved, has her in getting laser because of the pressure in her eyes was so great, they needed to do something immediately. So they actually used a laser, what was, did they do 600? No, that was for the retinopathy. Not, that wasn't the pressure, that was the retinopathy. Oh, for retinopathy, for, but anyway, but that was, over the next two weeks she had, I think, two or three 600 shots in one eye or the other, back and forth. And the pressures, everything started to begin to settle down a little bit. 
Then she needed to go in for surgery, cut surgery on the eyeball. There's a, a valve they can place on the eye to help reduce the pressure. For those that aren't aware of glaucoma, you get extreme pressure that builds up in the eye. And if that's not controlled, she mentioned the Graves disease. You've probably seen people out there who look like they have bulging eyes. That is caused by the tissues behind the eyeball that are inflamed or not happy. So the neuro ophthalmologist was involved that day, then scheduled her to go in and have laser surgery, oncology type at Renown, where they went and they started hitting the back of the eye, trying to get the tissues to settle down. The whole intent here is to try to trick the brain to think the things aren't as bad as the brain thinks they are. So we're playing this mind game. Anyway, I'll rapidly go forward. Over the next few years, this was in 2003 now, um, many surgeries, many treatments, um, ultimately visits to UCSF's Beckman Eye Center in San Francisco, which we made, I don't know how many trips, multiple ones getting another set of eyeballs. By 2010, she had been struggling through work, as she described. By 2010, she would come home and say, Cindy sort of thought maybe it might be best if I, you know, stepped aside here. Um, long story short, the, the doctors opted out of doing their own business office stuff, which is what she was doing. She worked for a group of doctors, and they outsourced it. So. They closed the office. Um, her sight was, as she said, sometimes good, sometimes not so good. Um, finally, by what, 2014, um, what caused the blindness wasn't any of those things I just mentioned. It was a staph infection on the cornea that destroyed the cornea on both eyes. So it was an external infection that um, the corneal specialist who she was seeing at the same time thought that there might be something we could do. Um, we've pursued that even further to San Francisco and as she said, light, the light and dark is so critical to her and they couldn't guarantee that if they did something that it wouldn't take that away. She says, nope, it's not an option. Anyway, um, one eye went 2010 or 11? 2009, Nine. December of 2009. Yeah. Anyway, and she still had a little bit of sight in the other eye when this mobility training and the thought about a dog surfaced. So she was working with the mobility instructor um, and it was fairly intense, at least once a week if not more, and it was in signal control intersections and out walking and et cetera. Um, and it's something you need to learn how to do. You don't just grab the cane and you're set to go. Anyway, um, there's been a couple of times when I've gone to things and they blindfold me and they say, okay, do this now. <laughs> I've been watching her do it, but I couldn't do it myself. Anyway, um, she was in the throes of the dog. We f they finally got through the mobility thing, made the application to guide dogs, and it's not a simple process. This is over a period of a year plus time. They finally accepted her. And they said, no, we're going to schedule you for whatever it was a couple of months down the pike. And they said, if something should change, we need to know immediately because it's going to alter what we're doing. Well, in between times, she lost sight in the other eye. So now she's totally blind. She would call guide dogs and they said, okay, we're going to re re move your application. Um, go back and work with your mobility instructor some more in one you get to the point where you can reapply, go ahead and reapply. So we went through this two-stage thing over a period of two years almost. And when they finally accepted her, scheduled, as she said, it was an intense thing. I took her down on Sunday. It happened to be Valentine's Day was the following Sunday, but um, dropped her off. The guide dogs was in San Rafael. They have a gorgeous dormitory facility, a phenomenal food service with chefs and they can pick and choose what they want to eat <laughs> or not want to eat. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, but <laughs> she should have told you about, why don't you tell everybody the day that they brought, 
Sunday I dropped her off. Monday is when they're introduced to the dog. So tell them about the, that introduction because you yeah. experienced that I wasn't there. So um, Sunday they they purposely don't give you the dog right away because they have when they during the application process they're make, taking videos of you see how you move because everybody is different and they when you get down there they want to see how you navigate without a guide and um, make sure that the, the guide that they have picked out for you is really going to be a good match. So, um, and, and I'll back up just, just a little bit. I, sh I should have mentioned it earlier. Um, during this application time, just prior to the time I went down for my training, um, the gal that was going to be my trainer called and had, we had long, uh, at least an hour, hour and a half interviews by phone. And she said, you know, we have a dog that was previously placed with another handler and af after seven months was returned to guide dogs. They never, to this day, I have no idea why she was returned to them. But for whatever reason, it wasn't a good match. And so they put her through her paces yet again. So. I'm thinking, here are these dogs, these darling little puppies that have their, their first home, they're birthed at guide dogs. And then they are adopted by a family by a puppy raiser. And they have that puppy raiser for about 14 to 16 months. And so they're all happy and everything's good. And all of a sudden they're taken away from the home and everybody that loves them and sent back to university. And so she, um, had gone back for training and she went through all the training and then they assigned her to a handler that's supposed to be her forever home and all of a sudden oh no that's not her forever home anymore so all I'm thinking about is this poor dog had no idea what, what sex it was what color what breed I mean I knew it would be a lab or a golden retriever or a cross because that's all the guide dogs uses but other than that, I had no specifics, but all I could think about was this poor puppy. You know, oh my goodness, how can you have so many homes? And so they asked if I had any objections, if I would, you know, would mind having a dog that had been previously placed. And I, I said, oh, I don't think so. You know, I, I, I said, you guys are in the business of matching people, so you're gonna have to make that decision, because I, I really, I've never, this is my first time around, I don't know. And so they said, okay, well, we'll um, keep that in mind. And then I didn't know anything more. And so the first, as I said, the first 24 hours, they're just watching to make sure that the, what the dog they have in mind for you is gonna be the right one. And they have about 250 dogs on hand at all times to be able to, to choose from. So they had chosen Joan for me and they had us go back after lunch. We went back to our rooms and waited. And so the door, knock at the door and I um, went and opened the door and then my trainer said, you know, go, go sit in your recliner. So I did and I sat there and then she brought Joan to me and she, she said, Susie, this is Joan. And she is, um, she is half golden retriever and half yellow lab. And she is um, creme brulee in color. And she has beautiful eyes with dark eyelashes. It looks like she has mascara on. <laughs> and so I'm, think, I'm seeing this, you know, this picture in my mind, having, you know, had vision for so long, I know how cute golden retrievers were. <laughs> so I, I was just so excited. So after she's reading me her bio, she, all of a sudden Joan got up and she put her, her head in between my knees and then her paw up on my, my right or my left knee. And I just, I just melted. It's like, oh, you know, I, I cannot believe that this is, you know, we just bonded immediately. Just, um, it's sweet and, and just, 
um, not that we, you know, at first it's, a, it's just like anything else. You, you, um, you have to get acquainted with each other and, and we did, but you know, you just know that she's, she's not going to do anything to, to harm me. She's not going to let anything harm me. She actually will curl in front of me if she if she's, sees something isn't right. She'll actually curl in front of me where I can't take a step. Or, as I said, um, you know, wanting to to cross the street and I couldn't hear that it was a windy day. Or the cars that are so quiet today you can't even hear them. And so, she um, will actually just not move. And even though I'm giving her the, the command to go ahead, she's not moving. And they call that intelligent disobedience. The dog is telling you something, you better listen to your dog. And that's something that was pounded into my head, listen to your dog. Even when, you know, Bill and I will go someplace and Joan will be with us and he'll say, he'll describe, you know, what the, what the, the overall picture is. And, um, and he'll, and she's slowing down and he says, I don't know what she's stopping for. And I said, she knows what she's stopping for. She's stopping for me. And then sure enough, there's a, there's a, a, a rise in the pavement that if, when you can see your, your mind automatically takes that into account. You never stop to think about it. You just know it's there, you deal with it. But when you can't see, you trip on it. And I, um, three years ago, um, I had actually, after church, Joan and I decided to go for a walk. And we go, we were going outside our community, have an exterior route. And um, we cross the street and our sidewalks are, are fairly narrow. Um, but we walked along and I had one foot going in front of the other, just like I always do. And all of a sudden I went down and I put my right foot, which I thought was right in front of me, but right in front of me was off the curb. And so I actually went down and um, I thought, oh my gosh. And Joan was like, mom. Mom, you know, are you okay? She, um, she wasn't gonna let me up. She's gonna leave me in the gutter. She's this dog. So she, she um, came over and I, are you, you know, are you okay? And it's like, jo it's okay, Joan, you know, let me get up. And I was just praying that nobody could see me because oh, what a, what a vision that would have been. But so she, um, I actually got up and I was sore um, you know, but I, I didn't know that I'd done it. So I, I'm kind of feeling around and I thought, oh, I've got a really nasty hematoma on my right leg. And, you know, probably about six inches. And I thought, well, I'm going to walk it off. So I got up and I walked a little bit farther and she was real tentative. And um, so after I realized that I was really okay, my ankle felt good. My, you know, everything else felt good. I, I just had a big goose egg on my leg. So I figured, oh, we'll just do this. So I called Bill and I said, hey, you know, could you put that ice pack in the freezer, make sure, and told him what I'd done. And I said, but we're going to, we feel okay. You know, no matter what I did, I was going to have to walk a distance to get home. I probably walked a little bit longer than I would have otherwise. But anyway, so by the time I got home, I had pretty good goose egg. So fast forward six days and I'm doing the dishes. So I'm putting the di dishes, um, I had, was putting a dish away and uh, that I had washed and forgotten that I'd left the door to the dishwasher down. Now this is not the first time I've done this. This brain, you know, it takes repetition to really draw it home. So I went over the dishwasher and down, but where I hit the dishwasher was right smack in the middle where that hematoma was. And it, um, and Bill and, and Joni were both back in our bedroom. And he came out and said, what's wrong? And he sees me sprawled on the floor, you know, in the line of the dishwasher. And he said, he, I said, I need to get up. But, and he said, hey, okay, well, put your back against the pantry here. And he, and this is all, we have a small kitchen. So anyway, I'm, I have my back on the um, the door, and, and all of a sudden, Bill looks over and he says, "Oh, Susie, we need help." And I said, "What's wrong?" And he said, 
you are bleeding you know, like hemorrhaging. Well, it's the hematoma <laughs> at first. So um, anyway, that was a journey, and, and some of you that were here know that that was, you know, the um, Wundvac and I were partners for about four months, and uh, luckily everything it turned out okay. It didn't have to have. It could have been a much worse sense, uh, scenario, but anyway, from that point, um, the doctors are telling me, you, you need to allow your leg to heal. You know, you can't be doing your long walks. You can't be doing short walks. You can't, we can let you walk 10 minutes a day. That's it. And I'm used to going for, you know, 45 minutes to an hour, hour and a half. So um, 10 minutes seemed like it takes me longer than that to get my gear on and her gear on to go for a walk. So this is really uh, not what I had anticipated, but um, during that period of time, finally got my leg healed and we were able to walk again. It was a long time going to that, that crossing that was right after we had crossed the street. And every time we went by there, she was super careful. I mean, just, we're really not gonna allow anything to happen. And that's her job, is to keep me safe. And I, to this day, I have no clue whether she, it was her error or mine. It really doesn't make any difference. Bottom line is, it happened, but she was so sensitive that, and, and continued to be, and still is in many, many ways. Um, she will show me things that maybe she doesn't have to, but she does. And uh, Like shadows or yeah. leaves. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> It makes a huge difference. Seeing, seeing uh, people's in the pavement vary with the light. So if the lights, you know, if, if you're walking at night, you can't see it at all. If you're walking during the day, it depends on how the light's hitting it as to whether she's going to see it. But this is exactly, it all goes back to the training and, and knowing, you know, where there's a possibility of having upheavals and, and where there isn't. One day I was walking, um, this is about two years ago, two and a half years ago, and we were going up South D'Andrea, uh, Gino Martini, and we were walking up the hill, and all of a sudden she stops. What the heck? We're just walking up the hill. My traffic's on my left. We're walking up. We're going, all right, why are you stopped? And she was not going to go, so I have, I wear Tell a fanny Tell me about pack. your stick or your yeah, I have telescoping. A, I have a fanny fanny pack that has um, my, uh, a, they call it a pointer cane. I have different canes for different purposes, but this one, it retracts and it's small, it, about that long, and she, which to a blind person that means nothing, but I'm going to say it's about, it's around seven inches long. And, um, <laughs> not this big. So um, anyway, and it retracts, and it's not designed to put any weight on it at all, but just for, for you to be able to identify what is that, is how deep is the, this curb? How deep is, is the snow that you're stepping into? Um, you know, just what is on my left, what's on my right? Is it a driveway or is it a curb? Um, what type of, you know, am I hitting snow or am I, am I hitting DG? I mean, it gives you a lot of information. And it's very compact, and you can just fold it up and put it away. So it's a, a great little tool to have. But um, I can't remember where I was headed with that one. Oh, why did you? You were going to describe. Oh, that day. So yeah. So I, I was start. I was getting my um, my cane out, and all of a sudden I hear this man, a Hispanic accent, ma'am, ma'am, and I, I said, what's what's wrong? And he said, ma'am, we've just cut out the sidewalk here. And so, so they, Bill had said they'd had for, for what, a week or something before that, they'd had caution tape and all that. Well, Does that help painted, a blind person? They painted the, the pavement first and then they went in and put the caution tape up and then they took out the concrete. Now, caution tape's great if you can see it, but if you can't see it, it's of no value. So anyway, now I'm not gonna say that had I not had John with me and I'd had a cane, I would have figured it out that there's a big drop um, and, and probably I would have just turned myself around and got back to where I come from and knew that it was safe. 
But um, no, Joan, she just, she did a great job. I told her it was okay and we went ahead and we stepped down. It was about a six inch drop. And um, I know what I can do off of four inches, so six inches would have been a, just a disaster. But, and then I said, so um, do you, what about, because I knew that there, these were areas that had, had extreme um, upheavals and I was well aware of them. And he said, uh, I said, oh, well, are you doing the one up the street there? And he said, yeah, the one up here. And I said, what about the one over on Frimio? And he said, yeah, we did that one too. And I went, okay, good. Well, I'm familiar. So, so from that point on, Joan was great. She was a trooper by the time we got through. She stopped for tumbleweed, tumbleweed, amazing. She will not, well, I wouldn't walk through the stuff either if it was at my nose. You know, that's, that stuff's mean. But she, no, she's, um, you know, listen to your dog. You know, the dog knows more than you do. You said she alerts you to changes in thinking. Like, how does she alert you? Stops. She just stops. She just stops. And then you left. And then I have to, and then it's the, and so I left, you know, <laughs> for somebody that is sighted to um, watch somebody that is not sighted. It must be really, you could put it to really fun music and figure <laughs> out, you know, so what are we doing? We're tapping with our foot. Okay, I'm not feeling anything with that foot. I'll use the other foot then. See if it's any different over there. No, nothing there. Okay, so then, the, because I have, she's always on my left, always, always. So um, I figured it's not, probably not gonna be on the left side because she would have avoided it but so it's got to be the right hand. So you're, okay, so I'm reaching over here, up here, and then she'll inch forward like a, in a couple of inches, and it's like, no, 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 it's okay, Joan. And she'll go through a little bit more, and then all of a sudden, I'll feel something, and I'm saying, God, God, you're good. And there's a big old branch hanging down. Did something just fall off? It did. Your, your, your microphone did. Uh-uh, okay. Anyway, so, um, no, that's, that's what she does. It's amazing. And would I have found that with a cane? No way. I was going to finish, but that's you. you. Oh, good. Paul has, this is Paul Cox. So um, wouldn't it help us or general public if you wore a tinted lens or a dark glasses rather than looking like you've got clear glasses, you can see anything all the time? Well, you know what, Paul, that's, that's really interesting because Mary Smith, I've known Mary for 44 years, and um, she said, I don't think of you as being blind. She said, you don't look like you're blind. I don't know what a blind person looks like. I never knew a blind person until I are one. Well, our uh, Roy Orbertson is blind, and he always wore dark glasses. Yeah, and, I, and Stevie, Wonder. Stevie Wonder, too. Uh -huh. But I don't know whether that's because their eyes maybe were, because um, I know, um, well, those of you that, that none of you knew me back in 2003, three, four, but um, no, my eyes would be unsightly red, just ruby red. Mm -hmm. Not, I had a friend at work and she said, Susie, I can't even look at you because your eyes make me hurt. <laughs> and they, that's when I had the rubiosis and, and it, was, um, it was unsightly. And so I'm wondering if people maybe wear dark glasses because their eyes are um, so, so unappealing to look at. Um, that's true sometimes. But it could be. Mm -hmm. um, why do I wear glasses? Because that's me. I understand. That's what I remember. That's my vision of myself. I so. don't know if you knew your lenses were still clear and not oh. dark. <laughs> <laughs> but then I want to know, is Bill a really good cook? It doesn't look like he's missed much. No. <laughs> You know what? That's it's really, <laughs> it's really, we eat very simply actually, because um, I used to do all the cooking and I do very little now. I can do salads and stuff like that, but um, but I, I'm not going to take on meats and and stuff. I know blind people do it. At that, it's just I just don't feel as good doing it. Um, but Bill um, barbecues almost everything, and. Um, Although he, he does do a, a, a mean chicken marinara. It's really easy and it's, you know, it's good. Yeah. But um, um, when you can't see, 
you're not tempted to eat the stuff that you shouldn't be eating anyway. <laughs> and that's my word of wisdom for the evening. Because, uh, honestly, I, we have snacks. Brady, Brady was giving me, because their family doesn't eat nuts. I love nuts. And so anything that, after Halloween, I got all the Almond Joys. I got all the Snickers. What else had nuts? Um, no, not mouths. Peanut M&Ms. Peanut M&Ms. Yeah. Yeah. Anything that had nuts in it. And so Brady would bring me a little baggie and he'd, Grammy, these are yours. And then I'd put them up in our, in our snack tray where I usually keep my peanuts, stuff that I can eat. And, but I forget about them. I can't see them. And Brady, so Brady would come over and he'd go, Grammy, you haven't eaten any of these. And I'd say, well, buddy, I forgot they were even there. So it's easy, it's easier, it's a great diet tool. Um, you know, that's something else, that really, there is no justice in this world. Because for years, you know, I struggled with weight and, you know, and I never really got grossly overweight, but, you know, it was always a struggle because I was always tempted to eat or, you know, and sometimes the stuff maybe that I shouldn't have been eating, but but then you finally get to the point where the scale's not changing and you know that you're not grossly overweight and you can't even see it. <laughs> so there is absolutely no justice. It's not fair. What was that? You need a scale that talks. I have a scale that talks actually. <laughs> So, no, I do. I have a scale, a, a food scale that talks. I have a, a phone that talks. Um, well, uh, my iPhone, of course, but um, no, my, my weight scale, that was one of the few things. When, when I lost my total vision was when all of a sudden I started getting these other aids because I, I, couldn't, I couldn't deal with it any other way. And as a diabetic, I have to c kind of pay attention to what my weight's doing but I'm not tempted to eat this stuff. And I love popcorn, and, but I know that I can't. Um, it's not that I can't have it, I can have it, but it's really hard for me to stop eating it. So I'm better off not taking the first bite. And that's really how I have to do a lot of stuff. I can't, I know what I can handle and I just can't, I can't stop. It's not an unhealthy food, you know, it's not. It's just that I want, I'm not gonna have just one cup or two cups let's be real and, and so okay so we'll go all right so i'm going to have four cups well what the heck if you're going to go to four cups you might as well have half the bag well wait a minute that's three quarters of the bag if you have that so you might as well eat the whole bag you know <laughs> oh my gosh do you ever now, experience uh, like on the commercials they talk about um people that are blind and about the day and night thing oh yeah sleeping um, no, because I still, I still see light. I think that's probably part of it. Um, so I, I am, and it's actually really easy. Uh, it takes very little light at night. I have a, a night light because um, our walls are kind of deflective. So they're kind of angled. And um, I know when I, where that night light is, I know the proximity to the, to the, um, restroom and and also how to get back to bed because I'm one of that age where women get up more than once during the night so um, anyway but it takes very little light um, in a dark room where you can very easily navigate find where you need to be so those are things you just learn, and, and actually the night lights that we have, probably I don't even need that much. I could actually probably do less because I can perceive the light. Um, so no, it doesn't affect, it does, for me, it does not affect my sleeping patterns. So that's a good thing. This is Lois James. Oh my goodness, 
they are amazing the state offers the training and it's the department of yeah Services to the blind. And Lois, I can't encourage, or for anybody that's struggling, um, get the help before you're too far, you to, before you lose too much. It would be far easier um, to, when you have the mental image to, to navigate. Um, but they are amazing. The people that trained me are no longer there. They've retired, but um, they have, they are amazing. They do a, a great job. They come out and actually, they um, will make suggestions for you. And they, Lois, you you live at um, Morningstar, right? Yeah, they should have somebody there. Yeah. Have they ever have have they ever asked you if you would like any help? No. Oh, you you need to advocate for yourself. And and just say that you you would like um you know, honestly, I don't know. I would think I don't know, but I would think that do they do they help you get to your meals and so forth? Right, yeah. While everybody's doing whatever they're doing, one of the big challenges that we have in our house is everything needs to always be in exactly the same place at all times. And if it isn't, I hear about it. <laughs> Where did you put it? Or, and I do it, but not as much as I used to do it, where she'll be talking to somebody and they'll say, what's well, right over there? As if she would know where right over there is. Um, or th those very nebulous comments that to a blind person have no validity. They don't know what that is. Anyway, um, huh? Yeah, yeah. How, how big is it? I don't know about that big. <laughs> anyway, um, you're, she was talking about her, her apparel. The stuff in the drawer, she has some things are folded facing one way and some are folded facing the other way so she knows which are long sleeve or short sleeve or you know summer or winter or whatever they are. Her jewelry is in a jewelry box and she knows once in a while she'll ask, she says, are these? But normally she just, you know, <laughs> like Cindy said, you do such a great job of dressing. <laughs> Tonight I did have to help her hook her. She's got a thing around her neck that matches her. Um, a necklace oh, that matches her, her ear her anyway and she couldn't get she the things that yeah, I don't know what's going on anyway the things that we that are cited just do in, in the normal course of things I have become well educated on 
what to do an example when Cindy was walking her up here when I do that I will sit there and say there's a step in five feet or three feet or two feet or whatever and when she gets close I'll say kick out so she can touch it and know it's there um, pastor when we came in tried to open the door for her that's really not a good idea for a blind person for two reasons one if they have a guide the guide is by training wants to be on the side opposite the hinge of the door and if there's you know two doors then they're going to go to the one where if when they go through it they're going to be in the middle of the doorway um, anyway and because the dog's on the left it's normally the right fly of the door um, so if somebody and we see it all the time trying to you know, reach out and be helpful. I mean, that's our, our nature. You know, let me help you, let me help you. For a blind person, it shouldn't be that way. It should be, ma'am, may I be of assistance? Let the blind person tell you if they need the help versus you taking it upon yourself to jump on it. Um, and pastor opened the door for when that happens. One, Joni's confused because that's not how it normally works. Two, Susie's confused because she needs something tactile. And if a door is open, there's nothing tactile now. Um, so if she can reach the door and then open it, then she knows, okay, I gotta have Joni on this side or that side. And you'll, if you watch her, she'll sit there and say, Joni over here, because Joni's always over here. But if there are hinges over there, she'll, example, when you go out the door by Marilyn's desk, she needs to be on her right because the hinge is on the left. Anyway, um, I mean, there's all kinds of those nuances, if you want to call it that. Um, what am I forgetting? <laughs> just don't hear many of them. Well, I think it's hard for all of us when you see somebody with a disability to know um, what to do. It's counterintuitive. Do. Right, like you want to, your natural. Yep. Yes, yep. to help them, but you're saying it's the, not the, all the statement that I've helpful. heard from a lot of not just blind, whatever, mm -hmm. treat me like I'm normal. Okay, don't try to treat me as if there's something wrong with me. Um, uh, you would go to a restaurant and um, well, first of all, we're not doing a lot of restaurants, and pretty much where we go is I know exactly what I'm going to have. But um, they'll talk to Bill, and they'll say, you know, like, yeah, would she like? And it's like, I, there's nothing wrong with my ears. <laughs> I, I, or my I, stomach, I can hear just or great. My taste buds. <laughs> and it, exactly, and, and, and another one of my favorite mottos is, if I can't see food, I eat it. I will. I, I, it, you've watched me. You've watched me when we had snacks. There wasn't anything left on those plates. I use my little finger and I make the sure. The finger sweep nothing, is much more efficient than anything left. we do with a fork. Yeah. But um, no, that's true. And I think, I think it, in general, um, and I'm speaking for myself, it's, it's, it's counterintuitive for you to watch somebody, you know, have more difficult time. You want and you just do it. You don't think, you know. And um, but for somebody that's blind, um, you know, <laughs> Bill. Everyone, it's, it's, it happens here at church. Jump down. Jump down. Over here. Jump down. Good girl. You're being a good girl. Yeah. Jump. Well, you know that's interesting because she doesn't come to me. She'll go to Bill. Seriously, we've had some real, some real digestive issues with her, and um, she's in the last couple of months she's had a real rough time where she she couldn't hold it anymore, and she was having accidents in the middle of the night, and she would she'd go and tell Bill after the fact. But um, she she um, I, I think she senses that you know Bill's the one that's cleaning it up. He knows where it is. <laughs> When I, if I if I smell something, I don't move. I literally do not move. Oh my goodness! Oh, 
because I have no idea. I mean, I may have been lucky getting to that point, but um, but I might not be so easy lucky going back. So I just stop where I am, and I just pray that my bladder's not overloaded because that's when you just oh my goodness. Um, but she it's really interesting she does not come to me and tell me she needs to go out we put her out on a regular basis and that seems to be enough for her but when her oh, i think we finally got the winning combination with food and we so far is this wood um it's plastic but plastic. yeah oh well it, yeah you mean uh, on the in, well, t right. Well, the dogs when the dogs are trained to to relieve on leash, and um, her leash actually is half of what it normally is. I can I can extend it farther, and so uh, what you do is you you allow the dog to circle around you, and then when they stop, then you follow the leash, find out where they are. And then you know and you feel the body position to figure out what they're doing. And if a bag is necessary, then you know you... Uh, somebody just asked me this today. How, how do you know where, you know where the mess is? And I said, you follow where she's squatted, and then you, you plant your foot. You, you choose which foot um, to we, where, where there might be a deposit, and then you, you pick it up. And then I, at that point, so say, say she has stopped. I'm hoping you can all see me. Lois, I apologize. But if she has stopped um, here, then more than likely, nothing is going to be to the right. Everything is going to be to the left. So you find out where it is, and then you, you work your way back, and you pick up as much as you can or whatever. I also make it a habit not to take more than one step because then you you're also you know it's possible that you could disorient yourself and when you can't see that's that's a big deal so um anyway and fortunately for me i have bill we live in an area that that they expect you to clean up after yourself or your dog and not everybody does, and I hear comments about people saying there are people in here that can see and they'll pick up after their dogs. And I think, well, that's not the way we're trained, so we're going to pick up what we can. But I'm not going to say that I'm going to pick up everything that's there because there may be something that, that's more. Or she, you know, she tends to be like a horse. Um, when she can't hold it, she'll drop it as you, <laughs> as you go. And, and I have no idea when that starts. I you know I can't tell. I can tell when she's ready to to stop. Um, I can tell by the motion of the handle. So um, I'll, I'll um, at that point just tell her to go ahead and do it, and then it will be done. And um, but that's you know, Bill can go um, you know make sure that it, that we're leaving it in good stead. Oh, I just had a question. Bill can keep going, but I was just claiming my place at the mic after him. Okay. So. First thing in the morning, she um, she got fed, and then we'd go straight outside and. Um, Again, everything was done on leash, and um, then she would she would relieve. Oh, okay. Well, then we'd go to breakfast, and then we'd finish breakfast, go back to the room, and get ready for our day's activities. We'd usually have about a half hour, 45 minutes worth of lecture, and then they'd take us out, and we had different. Each day we did something different. They took us into downtown San Rafael and um, would walk us. And they would tell us you know, what we were doing. Um, some of the routes that we did m multiple times over that. Most of the um, away from campus work, um, 
in downtown San Rafael was done the first week. And um, then we, they have a, they call it the downtown lodge. This is how, <laughs> our lounge, this is how, um, I don't know, uninformed I was, I guess. They said, you can go to the downtown lounge. And I'm thinking, I don't drink. I have no desire to go to a bar situation. And so I really thought that that's what it was. No, it's not. It's like, it's like a, um, a building that has, it does have a very small kitchen area where they have snacks if you want them. And um, of course, restrooms, and they have crates for the dogs. And um, because when you are training, you're training one-on-one -on -one with your trainer, um, and, but each trainer would have two handlers in her vehicle. So while one of us was being worked, the other one would be at the lounge. And, then we, and it was a wonderful, a wonderful opportunity for me to talk to and to meet with other people that were blind. And most of them had been blind far longer than I had. And most of them, again, were, were there for um, successor dogs. But um, anyhow, it was uh, trying to remember everything. And is working for training, you know, I, I walked with a cane and I learned counting steps. I learned, I learned how to correlate my iPhone when it was giving me messages. I realized, oh my gosh, that's mid-block. Oh, okay, because I'm counting steps. I got to 50. Oh, and there's 100 at the end of the block. Ah, that must be a bit block. Guess what? That's where the mailboxes are. And so all these things you, you just kind of learn. Well, now you're going to a completely different um, um, training area. And so um, the signs, a lot more traffic. Um, everything is, is just different. So it really, t it takes every bit of, it took every bit of gray matter I had to pull it all together and to try to keep it all straight. Um, and, but the training was invaluable. I was so, so thankful for it. But um, do I want to, and they also gave us the option of um, whether we wanted to go into downtown San Francisco. I thought, boy, I didn't want to go to Grand Town South San Francisco when I could see. I don't know why I would even consider doing it now. But, um, it's um, uh, uh, it's 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 a program that that is not there to dictate w what you need to do. It's there to support what you want to do with your life, and so and what your needs are. So I opted not to go into downtown San Francisco, and um, I uh, pardon me. I also opted not to do the night walk because I really. At, at this point in my life, I really um, not comfortable going out at night. I wouldn't have been when I could see. So why would I be doing it now? I do in our neighborhood actually because it is more protected. It's well lit and it's you know a bunch of over 55ers. So you know it's I feel I feel relatively safe there and and I know that Bill's at home too. Um, if that weren't the case, I wouldn't be going out at night. No way. So, um, so why do, although walking in the summertime, um, because it was so hot during the day, we were walking just at dusk and we'd be back after dark. And it was, you know, that's the only time it was cool enough to do it. But um, anyhow, by the, by the end of the day, we, after um, we had our morning workout and then we would come back, um, and have lunch at, at Guide Dogs and then they'd take us for this for our afternoon exercises, whatever they were they were working on at that point in time. Um, everything that they did was super compressed, time-wise. It's a, it was a 13-day program, and um, one of the gals, the, the other gal that was there with me, she was there for her sixth guide, and she said she had gone through the training the first time. It was a four four-week training. And then, then she'd also been to the Oregon campus as well. And then she said that then she also had dogs that would, she went for a three week training. And she said, um, and this is two weeks, but everybody that had, the, all the fellows that were there too said, man, to do this in two weeks, it is really intense, brutally intense. It just, it, I was drained. So, um, but, 
you know, it all comes back to you. And even the training that I had with, you know, my cane training here, uh, I still hear the voices of the people that were assisting me, giving me pointers along the way. And it's not that you'll encounter that scenario every single day, because that doesn't happen. But, um, but all of a sudden this voice will come into your head and say, listen to your dog. You know, when I'm telling her to go ahead, it's okay, go ahead. She's not moving for a reason, so figure it out. And um, there was, um, about a year and a half ago, I, she was not moving. And we had snow, but it was, the sidewalks were fairly clear. And so I thought, well, it's warm enough outside, I'm not gonna worry about falling at that point. So, um, but she was not moving, she just stopped. And I couldn't figure it out, so I put my hands down to try to figure it out. And I'm, I'm not feeling snow. So I thought, oh, okay, well it feels like DG. But she wasn't moving. And I'm thinking, she walks through DG, it's okay. She knows, she points it out, she shows me it's there. So I know it's okay, but she wasn't moving. So I finally, I was really exasperated, and this is like a block from our house. So I finally called Bill and I said, I don't know why she is not moving, but she is absolutely not moving. And he came down and he, they poured rock salt all over him. What I was feeling is felt like DG was rock salt. And it's very caustic to dog's paws. And so here I am trying to get her to walk through something and her paws are burning. So she now has booties, um, but I didn't know, and you know, and I don't get down and feel with my hands very often. It's very rare that I'll do that. Um, normally, I'll just kind of coax her through it, and we'll just go very slowly. She's great about um, just slowing down. You know, if something's different, I'll just slow you down, Mom. We're doing this really slow. That's okay. That's okay. We're going to get through it. Good. Good job. Are you ready for another question? Sure. Okay, Pastor. Okay, I have two questions. You can pass if you want to, but earlier when you were talking about sleeping, I was wondering what your dreams are like. <laughs> you know, you don't I, have to tell me if you don't want to. But no, 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 just... no. <laughs> Quite interesting because some people will say um, so much of what I, um, the way I perceive the world is my mental image of what everything was before I lost my vision. So. Somebody said, um, do you dream in color? And I thought, I don't, I don't pay attention to my dreams. I don't, you know, I just don't. But after having that question posed to me by a child, by the way, um, I, uh, I started thinking about it. And every once in a while, I do dream in color. So, and I do, this is really one of the, um, you know, when we went down to find out if I'd be a good candidate for a corneal transplant a couple of years ago, and we were down at UCSF, and as soon as the doctor said, you know, the downside is, he said, yes, we could do it, and you might have a 40% chance. And I said, so what are, what are the, um, uh, the, the, the negatives? And the, when he said, well, you could lose all vision, and that's when I just, I, I, I don't know what he said from that point forward, because I thought there's no way that I would sacrifice what I have. So um, anyway, um, I, I think I, I dream just like, just like how do you brush your teeth? I brush my teeth the same way. How do you comb your hair? I comb my hair the same way I'm used to combing it. How do you do anything else? It's nothing has changed because I've lost my vision. Um, I certainly taste very well. So um, I honestly, I, I can't answer it any better than that because I, um, I, I don't, that, other than the fact that I can't see nothing about me really has changed. Our lives have certainly changed, you know? Well, that um, kind of leads me to my second question, which is, are there any parts of scripture or verses that you have a new appreciation for or understanding in this 
new period of your life? Oh, I knew you were going to, or somebody was going to ask me something <laughs> like that. And, I'm the and pastor, we've, I have to. And know? we've already <laughs> spoken, and I told you, I am not, I am not, I never have been one to memorize scripture. You I, don't have to give me a verse. I was just curious if just, there's anything you hear and you just say, well, that, that strikes me a little different. Because you have no, a new experience that most of us don't. Well, you know, you, you talk about, um, the, um, I'm now I'm blind, but now I see. Well, if if from it's not a figurative thing. Any, I mean, it is. Um, you you were not of a person of faith, and now you are. Um, it's not the fact that you are blind. Katie, at one point, there was a, a the Bible story. Well, uh, where Jesus had taken mud and put it on the blind woman's eyes. And, and she could see. And Katie had commented, maybe, maybe they could do that for Grammy, you know, so that she could see. And yeah, if it was that simple, man. But, um, but there's so much more to life than just sight. And I think of so many people that are so, um, have so much, so many more problems that you know, I have workarounds, and things are not the same, but there are ways to get around it. And in most cases, and sometimes you just throw up your hands and just say, you know what, it's just not worth it. You know, it's not, um, I can't do this. One of the biggest thrills of our lives, or mine for sure, um, a couple of years ago, Katie's back at prep, and I had no idea. I mean, I'm hearing descriptions of campus from Christy and Ryan and Brady and Katie as well. And, and Katie would say, well, I'm going to the CAF or I'm going, you know, I'm going to the gym or I'm going, you know, I'm, I'm doing this. And I, and I just told Bill, I, I just, everybody else is looking at pictures and seeing, you know, has, for, in Bill's case, is looking at pictures and, and he has a perspective of where everything is. And, and, but I didn't have that. I couldn't, I couldn't wrap my head around it. So we made the decision to go back and, and visit Katie um, at the end of her freshman year. And, um, well, oh, uh, yeah. yeah. But that, um, going back and, and experiencing the camp, Chris, Katie was so excited. She's so cute. She says, Grammy, when you come, I'll give you a cane tour of the whole campus. Because quite honestly, that's the difference in having a cane and having a guide. A cane, you have a, a, a tactile, immediate feedback. With a guide, you're being, you're being escorted around obstacles. And yes, she will show me things, but I still have no idea spatially what's out there. She, she can't talk to me. I mean, she's telling me, she's keeping me safe, but she can't say, well, there's a building over here and there's a bunch of kids over here and there's, a... she can't describe that to me. That's something that I learned more from tactile input than anything else. So um, as a, that was an amazing experience. And, um, I, ah, and then we, we also got to do some traveling coming back, which is something that we had not done for many, many years. So that was an added bonus. But just to, to, just to be there, the, hear the history of, of really living the history of the Wells and um, being in that chapel, oh my goodness. And then at seminary to, to be there when just, at the beginning, when they start the the um, the call service, oh my gosh! I mean, the hairs still they stand up on the back of my neck. Just so thrilling, so amazing. I just um, I can't put a price tag on that. That was just just the epitome of everything. And and then of course, and Katie being there, and it was just it was a whirlwind five days. I don't know if I could ever. Um, go at that pace again. It was it was really grueling, but it was 
amazing. Th th it was just wonderful. But I know that there will be a time, sadly enough, we are all going to be together again and we will all be able to see and that may be a good thing or a bad thing for um, for me it's going to be amazing to see Brady as a man with real teeth <laughs> Hopefully he doesn't have teeth. no I know and when his voice changes then I'm really going to be really oh my goodness to hear his little excited voice. My Wednesday afternoons with Brady, who was, he was kind of struggling with reading a little bit, and um, then, then it was, you know, Christie's in school on Wednesdays an hour longer than he is. Well, luckily, our, the school isn't too very far from our house, so we would pick him up on Wednesdays. My Wednesday afternoons with Brady were amazing. The memories that we have, this little guy sitting at my feet just reading to me and enjoying the reading and the stories and oh my goodness you can't put you can't put price tags on stuff like that and it comes and you know the season's going to end you know that there's going to be the time when he doesn't want to be there and be reading to you anymore and you know that he's really not going to like reading anymore and you know but but those few years that we had were so special um, and unfortunately, Katie had gone beyond that point, although her school was even closer. Um, but we were there more to, to get her to and from dance or get her home on a, on a crummy day. But um, and yeah, there, there's, there are things in life that are so precious that you don't, you don't need the stuff. You know, even now, when we moved, we downsized big time. And I'm sure there's still stuff that we don't need. I, um, I have to say it really is a blessing. When we moved, we had a pro overload of Christmas stuff that we had loved in our other house where we had more space and, and just really enjoyed decorating for Christmas and, and the ornaments on the tree and the whole bit. But you, when you get to a point where you can't see it anymore, it really, um, then, then I start thinking of different terms. I think, is it going to break? If it's going to break, I'm going to step on it and cut myself, or Joan is. So that's not good. So anything that's breakable is pretty much gone now. Um, and all of the Christmas, our son you know, is a real minimalist, and he's not a believer on top of it all, which is sad, but um, he said, Mom, you know, you, what's the reality? You, you're not going to use this stuff. You know, you just need to let it go. And it was, that was hard. That was the, I think, the hardest moment that I had in, um, in losing my sight was all of a sudden just literally letting go of anything, and we didn't have time to go through it. I mean, it was just literally bins and bins and bins of stuff, and um, let it go. And but as he said, you still have your memories, and that's so true. You, you don't you you don't need the stuff. It was wonderful looking and enjoying and and you know having a memory just recounted to you just at a glance. But I still have the memories. I just don't have the thing to to prompt them. They just come freely. Are there any other questions? Whew. Are you exhausted from all this talking? Yeah. You do. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. What was it? Oh, wow. You spoke I'm sorry, you guys. Hours. I'm no. sorry, you guys. No. no, it was very, very interesting. Thank you so much. Mm. Oh, that, you know, before, this is something that, um, as I said, I, we spoke to guide dogs this week just as a matter, it was my, it was my yearly call. But um, a couple of things I had to look up for me and questions to ask. For people who are blind and you, you see 
Um, <laughs> actually, I was training, and uh, we were crossing over by Deer Park, and um, we were crossing, what street is that? Um, the, the busy? Prater? Prater? No, not Prater. No, well, Prater was one of them, but the, the parallel, I mean, the perpendicular. Rock. Rock. Thank you. <laughs> and so, um, anyhow, my, my instructor was standing on a corner over at the corner of Rock and Prater by the park, and he said, okay, Susie, you can do this, you know. And, he, you know, it's like mm, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, so there's a lot of traffic. And I'm, I, I, this is long before I had Joan, so um, I, I'm trained to listen for traffic flows and, and all of the rest. And, and Forrest was there. He was watching. He was, you know, he was my eyes on the ground. But um, anyhow, he wanted to see how I would navigate all this. And so I did, and I made through the first crossing, and then I crossed Prater, and I got to the second crossing, and then, then I'm turning back again to cross Rock. And this lady was from the other side of the street, and she's just frantic. And she's going, ma'am, ma'am, ma'am. And she comes running over my direction and grabs me, let me help you, let me help you. And I said, no, that's okay, it's okay, I need to, I'm training, I need to do this. And she said, no, no, no. And I said, it's okay, my instructor's across the street over here, it's okay. And she said, no, 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 let me help you, let me help you. And so, and you, you, you have to draw that line to say, you know, you don't want to be firm because you're really, really grateful that somebody is actually looking out for you and cares. But at the same time, um, this was, and I, so I got back and I said, Forrest, did you see it? He said, he said, says you did the right thing. There's no way you're going to get around that one. But um, to, to um, just speak out and say, if we're in a store and people will ask, ma'am, do you need help? I have no idea who they're talking to. Have no clue. And it would be helpful if you, say, if you didn't know anything else to say, um, ma'am, the one with the dog, you know, that would be a clue that th that's, she must be talking to me. But, you know, when you ask open questions like that, you don't, you don't know. And, and when we leave church and we're in the, um, uh, yeah, okay. yeah, North X area, Fellowship Hall, yeah. And people are, now we're not gathering so much like we used to, but um, and Bill will see somebody or be over talking to somebody and all of a sudden I'm there by myself. And it's like in the middle of a room. Uh, this is a little disconcerting. You know, give me an edge. <laughs> if you give me an edge, I can find it. But give me an edge so I have something to follow. But, um, and, and, um, and, and Bill was saying, if you offer somebody who is blind, offer them assistance and if they take it you know take their you're going to take their right arm elbow. or elbow i'm so i'm going to be grabbing with my left hand and um, have them guide me that way and so i actually hold at the elbow so that i can feel the but body movements well no 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 that's you're true not, true okay so it, it's the, it's the opposite when i have joni okay. when i have joni i always take the the left elbow but um, that's how you can really assist somebody who is uh, visually impaired. Or, or, and you always ask, always just ask. Because people that are, are, um, have limited vision or whatever, they know whether they need assistance or not. And if they do, they will accept it graciously and thankfully. But just, um, just, just communicate, just ask. Same deal with um, petting the dog, you know. Always, if you somebody with a with a guide, never, you know, try to go up and and try to pull the never touch the dog's handle. Everything comes through me. So um, you tell me what you want me to do. I, this happened just if, when I said we got crossways a few days ago. Um, I don't know to this moment. I don't know what happened. I had a, a, a gotten a um, pebble or something in my foot. And we'd cross the street, and I knew I had to shake it out, so I had to stop and take my sandal off. And, and in the process of doing that, I don't know what happened. But all of a sudden, Joan was not reacting the way she normally does, and she wasn't moving. And I got my cane out. I could not figure out what, what had gone wrong. Well, I had a neighbor that I, on the corner that I see periodically, and he said, Susie, 
let me help you. And so he's describing things not in terminology that means anything to me. And so I, he said, no, just come this way, follow my voice, just come this way. And I'm going, no, I need, you know, tell me where we are and then I will be able to kind of put it into perspective. But just, and he said, no, it's okay, you, you know, and it, it turned out he did, he, he, um, he guided me the way that he wanted to, to guide me, but not the way Joan was comfortable, nor was I. And I, you know, and I didn't, he's an older man, so I certainly wasn't gonna try and put him down because he's honestly trying to help me. But the, um, the signals that we were getting were so, uh, were not on the same page. And it's amazing the number of people in our neighborhood had no idea the names of the streets or what direction they are. <laughs> not a clue, not a clue. Well, it's just over here. I don't know. Well, this, this other block. You know, give me something. Yeah, oh, they don't. I, I don't do that. No, no, well, I, I did. Is it, is it past your bedtime? What, what time is your bedtime? My bedtime? Uh -huh. You're not asking the right person. <laughs> I'm a night owl. Four in the morning? Well, I, <laughs> let's, let's, let's put it this way. Um, a lot is driven by my Dexcom. So if I don't go to bed, I mean, if I go to bed and my sugars aren't right, mm -hmm. um, and then it alarms and it gets me out of a dead sleep, oh. that drives me crazy. So I'd rather stay up and deal with it before I go to bed. So very often I won't go to bed until like two or three, very often. But I'm, I'm not saying I'm not going to sleep as I have a recliner and I will fall asleep in the recliner. Mm -hmm. But If you don't mind, can we close with prayer? Yes. That's okay? Yes. All right. Pastor's going to close in prayer. Let's all pray. Dear, dear Lord, thank you for Susie. Thank you for allowing all of us to know this wonderful woman with such a strong faith, such a wonderful perspective on her life. And Lord, we just ask that you continue to bless her, continue to lift her up, continue to shower her with many blessings and continue to, to allow us to see her faith shine in all of our lives. Thank you, Lord, for this great blessing. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. And thank you, Lord, for all of us, all of the people of the Springs. Amen. Amazing people. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank you. Yeah. My good girl. Okay. Do you want um do you want me to undo you? Yeah, yeah, please. Okay.